The only thing that has prevented us from attacking Iran has been the professional military, starting with Admiral Fallon, who, who was sacked in March, and now Ad Admiral Mullen. Uh, if you hear Admiral Mullen, you know, he gets up at this press conference after he's been in Israel and he says, you know, the last thing we need is a third front. Uh, we don't need anything to cause instability uh, there. So any nation, any nation that would cause that instability uh, should, should think twice about it. Now, who's he talking about? Two nations come to mind, the United States of America and Israel. Oops. Not supposed to mention Israel in polite conversation. Well, let me tell you folks how I think, and I still think there's at least a 50-50 chance that we will be dragged or we will let ourselves intentionally be dragged into bombing Iran. See, we don't, we don't have really real casualties if we bomb Iran, right? We, we have these people in the blue suits, these generals, the same ones that told us in Vietnam that we could you know, bomb the Ho Chi Minh Trail and Ho Chi Minh would give up and so it is. You know. We have these guys saying, now Mr. President, we have these really fancy weapons. Uh, they can't see us come in because we're stealth people and we'll drop all the bombs and knock out all these sites and nobody will be shot down and, and just, you know, we'll, we'll be all, you know, be finished in, in a little while. At least we would be able to take out a lot of things. Well, that's crazy. That's really crazy. But, you know, our president and our vice president have not been the sanest folks in the world. <laughs> now, the uniform military, Admiral Mullen, and I would say Robert Gates, have been really part of the government that is saying, crazy. You know, think, think not only of, of the strategic uh, aspects of this, but what would happen when, when Iran closes the strait? The foremost, they would. I mean, even Mullen was forced to admit that at, at a press conference. Yeah, he said, yeah, they could close the strait, but we're going to open it right up, okay? And what's it going to take, Scott, to open it right up? Marines. Oh, but, you know, so we send in the Marines. Well, where the hell are we going to get the Marines? They're all in Afghanistan or going there. Or they're all in Iraq. It's crazy. It's really crazy. But there's one nation that sees, if you believe what they say, an existential threat from Iran. Never mind that they stop working on the weapons-related part of their nuclear program. Uh, Never mind that even if they restarted it, they'd be several years away from the actual nuclear weapon or the means to deliver it. What's the time frame that is driving the Israeli leaders? Yeah, five months. Why? Because this president and vice president have undertaken to make sure that they deal with Iraq before they leave off, I'm of sorry, deal with Iran before they leave office. They've promised, well, they've said it publicly, but the Israeli leaders believe that they have undertaken this commitment. And, you know, Bush is the kind of person that people like Richard Pearl can go up to and say the kinds of things he said before Iraq. And that was, uh, Mr. President, with all due respect, you're way out on a limb now with respect to Iraq. You know, were you to not invade and deal with Iraq, uh, you know, the country would never be able to outlive the infamy of, of not going through with our threats. You would be shamed. That's the kind of thing that talks to this president. And that's exactly the kind of thing that Richard Pearl, Wolf Woods, and all these folks who still have entree to the president will be, say, will be saying to him. So what's, what, how do I think a war could start? I think that given the, what I've just said here, that the Israeli government has been given the initiative here. They've been given the power to start a war. How could they do it? <laughs> uh, I don't have enough time to enumerate the ways. There could be an Iranian flagged uh, PT boat in the Gulf sinking one of our destroyer escorts, an American destroyer escort. Now you would say, well, the Israelis would never do that, would they? They'd never sink it or try to sink an American ship, would they? Well, some of you know. You know, this is an enlightened audience, but when I talk around the country, 
300 people, let me just tell you this, 300 people in a, uh, in a church auditorium in, gosh, in Missouri, I forget the name of the city, okay? And I, and I met, mentioned this in connection with the Walt Mearsheimer book, which uh, really uh, talked about the, the Israel lobby. Someone asked me what I thought of it, and I said, well, you know, uh, I think it's right on, except I'm really mystified as to, as to why they, they missed, why they ignored uh, the most convincing proof of the power of the Israel lobby in our country. And I saw people kind of look in, and I said, I'm referring to the USS Liberty, of course. And everybody kind of, and I said, does anyone here uh, know about the USS Liberty? Three people out of the 300 raised their hands. I picked up the first person there in the third aisle. I said, sir, um, would you tell us who you are and how you know? Sir, Bryce Lockwood, U.S. Marine Corps, member Liter Liberty Crew. I said, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, would you feel that you could come up here and tell us what happened? Sir, it's been 40 years. I have not been able to do that just yet, but I think I would like to try that tonight. And he came up. He was one of the Marines. He was a Russian linguist, but he was uh, sent on the USS Liberty. And he was one of the Marines that uh, was not killed he was the only NSA operator who was not killed when the torpedo hit them amidships. And he explained exactly what happened, how the Israelis uh, had uh, reconnoitered the ship starting at 6 o'clock in the morning, came back with their uh, aircraft and their PT boats, and did their best to, to sink it and leave no survivors. How do I know that? Well, because their machine guns uh, riddled the uh, lifeboats that they put out when they were, uh, looked like it was going to sink. Well, I'm going on too long here, but the, the point is simply that uh, our country is woefully uninformed about these things. Bryce Lockwood set us all straight there, talked about how he re rescued one of, his, one of his colleagues and tried to rescue another, um, but his friend slipped through his grasp and floated out through the uh, five foot or the five yard uh, hole made in the, the hull by the uh, Israeli torpedo. Why were they trying to, uh, to sink our ship? Well, because they were going up on the Golan Heights the next day, and they didn't want our monitoring ship to tip off our uh, policymakers so that they would do these uh, uncomfortable remonstrations, saying, look, please don't do that. They didn't want any of that. Or they were afraid that the USS Liberty right off El Arish there were where uh, several Egyptian, uh, several, several hundred Egyptian prisoners had been massacred after digging their own graves. We have this from Israeli journalists, by the way. They were afraid that we would get word of that. Well, let me just uh, end here and look forward to the, uh, to the conversation. Um, but uh, I just would cite uh, one, one noted author, because I think it speaks to the signs of the times here. His name was Dante, okay, and he's been, he's been repeated by many, many people. And what he said was this, he says, uh, uh, the hottest places in hell have been reserved for those who remain neutral in times of crisis. Now, I, I'm guessing that there's no one neutral here and I'm guessing that many of you have been really doing more than your share of the work. All I'm saying is that if we don't rise to the occasion, well, we can all just go to hell.